Peter B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. Gosh, it's already Thursday, January 17th, 2019. And on both sides of the Atlantic, I am scratching my head, trying to explain the actions of legislators who call themselves conservatives. So first up in the United Kingdom, the British Parliament, which earlier this week shredded the aspirations of Prime Minister Theresa May, a conservative, to pass the Brexit package. Yes, they rejected it by 230 votes, the worst defeat in British history. Then, almost reflexively, Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn, he announced a vote of no confidence. The vote was staged, and the Conservatives rallied to support their girl. <laughs> <laughs> and this account from uh, the New York Times, the Labor Party is making a bid to dissolve the government, leaping to Mrs. May's defense like gallant knights are fellow Tories, among them many who have spent the last few months plotting to remove her. <laughs> One who has uh, been against her Brexit position said she personifies duty. She is a patriot and a servant of our country. Another praised her inspirational leadership. <laughs> And yet another predicted that her stock in this country will rise dramatically. Well, it's at zero, so that could be a safe bet. And in this uh, kind of amusing piece at the Times, they refer to this as a Groundhog Day in which Theresa May awakes every day to discover herself in a dire political crisis and every day survives in her grim, implacable way. So it's not the hair on her chinny-chin-chin. Chin. It was 19 votes that allowed her to hold on to her job. And this is really confusing to somebody like me, an armchair expert <laughs> many miles away, because I would think that the effort would be to try to find a way either to allow for a second vote of the public in Britain or some other manner <laughs> to deal with this. But it's uh, really confusing, incomprehensible, to see how these people are operating. And then we go to the United States Senate, controlled by Republican conservatives. And yesterday, there was this dramatic showdown as the Senate tried to overturn a decision that was made just 30 days ago by Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin. And there's some technicalities here. The action by Mnuchin would have stood, as of the end of the day Friday, if Congress made no move to intervene. What was the move he made? Well, he relaxed the sanctions on three companies connected to Russian oligarch Oleg Deripaska. Now, I'm not a big fan of these sanctions. I'm not a believer in the Russiagate narrative. But, hey, if we're going to be consistent, and if our elected officials actually believe the intelligence community reports and all of the media coverage that has led so many people to buy into the Russiagate narrative, why would Mitch McConnell, joined by Mitt Romney, who is a fresh senator from Utah, and the guy who occasionally postures as a deep opponent of Donald Trump and uh, what he considers to be his low-class operation. So I, I really am confused by this because they got almost a dozen Republican senators to vote with the Democrats, peeled them off from their lockstep loyalty to Trump. And as I mentioned yesterday, that in itself is progress. But I'm looking at a dispatch uh, on this from the Associated Press that appeared in my San Francisco Chronicle this morning, and there is zero mention of the maneuver by the leader, McConnell, and by Romney, and there were six other Republicans who staged a mini filibuster, gumming it to death and running out the clock, expecting that they could at least uh, lumber into Friday and run out the clock until Mnuchin's decision has to stand. So, again, I say that this defies logic. And the coverage is also 
either intentionally, you know, omitting this little dramatic episode in the Senate, or maybe they think、uh, it just doesn't matter. The final decision is all that matters. So today, they, despite the fact that the bill didn't pass in the Senate and has no future, more than 130 Republicans in a meaningless vote grandstanding on this dead issue, they joined House Democrats in opposing that Treasury Department plan to ease Russian sanctions against the Deripaska related companies. The vote in the House lopsided 362 to 53. And this was an easy, painless vote for those Republicans. Maybe some of them will be able to use it later to say, Look how I stood up to Trump. <laughs> And again,、uh, I just find this really, really bizarre. And to add more confusion, Rudy Giuliani went on the、uh, Chris Cuomo show on CNN last night. And further muddied the waters about collusion and no collusion. He dialed back on a comment that he made last night, saying that he didn't intend to、uh, suggest that members of Trump's campaign may have conspired with Russia. He told Cuomo, I never said there was no collusion between the campaign or between people in the campaign. Cuomo said, Oh, yes, you have. <laughs> And Giuliani said, No, I have said that the President of the United States was not involved. And he said he can only speak for his client, not for the thousands of great Americans who worked on the Trump campaign. I represent only President Trump, not the Trump campaign, Giuliani says. There is no collusion by Trump in any way, shape, or form. Likewise, I have no knowledge of any collusion by any of the thousands of people who worked on the campaign. Now, this is clearly a walk back. He is modifying his previous statements. And Giuliani has done this before. He thinks he's very clever. I don't share that assessment. But he made this point. Even as he said he couldn't speak for Paul Manafort, Giuliani went on to play down the significance of his relationship, Manafort's, with Kalimnik, the alleged connector to Russian intelligence. And this relates to the New York Times recent report that Manafort had shared polling data with Ukrainians, not with Russians, as was originally reported in the New York Times, and they had to correct that. So, Giuliani said, sharing polling data with Ukrainians who happen to have or are alleged to have a favorable relationship with Russia, they're not Russians. They're not Russian government officials. It would be like sharing polling data with an English guy and say, we're colluding with America.、Uh, I don't think that metaphor really works there, Rudy. But to his central point, <laughs> it is accurate. And the New York Times blundered in its.、Uh, False report that they had to quickly correct. So, this morning on Facebook, a number of my friends who are big、uh, buy, people who buy in deeply to the Russiagate narrative posted a piece from Wired Magazine, and a guy who I conclude is an access journalist, his name is Garrett Graff, and he presents、uh, obvious false choices. He basically says, and he regurgitates the recent reporting of the New York Times and the Washington Post. You've heard it, saying that Trump worked for Russia and that he、uh, you know, kept secret his one on one meetings with、uh, Putin, which you know, raises all kinds of questions. And I, I do understand that, but we can't answer those questions. But in this piece,、uh, Mr. Graff、uh, goes, goes、uh, pretty strong. He said, the, We've reached a point in the Mueller probe where there are only two scenarios left. Either the president is compromised by the Russian government and has been working covertly to cooperate with Putin after Russia helped him win the 2016 election, or Trump will go down in history as the world's most famous useful idiot, as communists call, though, used to call those who could be co opted to the cause without realizing it. And he builds his whole essay here on that false choice. Never for a moment. Considering that the FBI may have, ha- may have had an agenda, that the intelligence community may have had its agenda. And his, his inability to recognize the obvious doubts and skepticism that anybody should employ in accepting the claims that originate anonymously from the spook community, 
He uses the ping pong technique that I talked about in yesterday's podcast, where the Washington Post published its story saying that Trump covered up his meetings with Putin. And the next day, the Times is out there recapping the Washington Post story and then adding in some little tidbits from an off the record conversation that one of their reporters had with Trump. Now, how they justify bringing that on the record is a little bit sleazy. And yes, Trump is sleazy too, but I cannot condone sleazy journalism. And uh, Graf here goes on to say, of course, the FBI wondered why Trump's actions toward Russia and the intelligence community were so aberrant and felt compelled to investigate. Now, hold that thought, because in a moment, we're going to get to the antidote of of that comment. Now, uh, Mr. Graf also makes no mention of the British connection, American Stephen Halper, who'd been a dirty trickster for Reagan, was uh, in there in the mix with the Orbis Communications people. That's Christopher Steele. His connections to, I think the guy's name is John Dearlove, the former head of MI6, and their connections to the Australian ambassador who turned in uh, George Papadopoulos. Well, this story is, is written, and the analysis is simply... A pro-government screed. He writes, The FBI's investigation during the 2016 campaign, which we now know was codenamed Crossfire Hurricane, began as an attempt to protect Trump. (laughs) Now, this is a novel, new bit of spin uh, placed on this. And in a moment, when I get to the antidote, I want you to remember Andy McCabe. Because Graf cites him. We know that there was evidence that deeply concerned both McCabe and Rosenstein. And we know, too, that we haven't yet seen that evidence. It's easy to forget how much more the FBI and Mueller know that we don't. <laughs> and then in the second last paragraph of this piece, it ran seven pages when I printed it out. He notes the New York Times included this caveat. No evidence has emerged publicly that Trump was secretly in contact with or took direction from Russian government officials. At the very end of the article, where most of the Russiagate fans will never land. (laughs) And I I am just amazed by the smoke screens and these these, uh, commentaries that I, I think are pandering. To people who are predisposed to believe this stuff. This is not conscientious journalism that offers proof for the conclusions that are reached. No. It is speculation passed off as conclusive reporting. Now to the antidote. My friend Ray McGovern at Consortium News yesterday under the headline, Russiagate Evidence, Please. He, re- he works over the same territory that uh, Graf just did. And he notes that uh, the Times accused Trump of secretly working on behalf of Russia. And Ray notes that uh, CNN joined the piling on, quoting former FBI counsel James Baker, to the effect that FBI officials were weighing whether Trump was acting at the behest of the Russians and somehow following directions, somehow executing their will. And McGovern notes the problem is that CNN has also reported that Lisa Page, the counsel to then FBI acting director McCabe, testified there had been indecision in the bureau as to whether there was sufficient predication to open the investigation. Predication is another word for evidence, McGovern notes. And then he says, on May 9th, 2017, Peter Strzok, who was having an affair with Lisa Page, uh, sent her a text. We need to open the case we've been waiting on now while Andy is acting director. And McGovern takes over in his voice. After all, if Trump were bold enough, he could have appointed a new FBI director. And who knew what might happen then? When Page appeared before Congress, she was reportedly asked what McCabe meant. She confirmed that his text was related to the Russia investigation into potential collusion. Now, the only real news in the New York Times story was that the FBI, uh, under McCabe, had opened a counterintelligence investigation. That had remained secret up until the publication last week. So Ray also goes into the Hoover tactic of uh, sharing 
salacious information with the subject of that salacious information as a way of、uh, gaining leverage over them. And he describes the meeting with Trump the first time with the spooks, and Comey sent Clapper and uh, uh, what's his name Brennan out of the room as he then sat down and reviewed the Steele、uh, dossier with Trump. And McGovern cites a New York Times interview with Trump, July nineteenth, twenty seventeen. When Comey brought the dossier to me, I said, "This really, it's made up junk." I didn't think about anything. I just thought about, man, this is such a phony deal. I said, "This is honestly, it was so wrong," and they didn't know I was just there for a very short period of time. Now let's assume that Trump is lying about this, like he lies about so many other things. Let's assume that even the the P tape scene actually occurred. Well, it clearly could have been used as a way to compromise Trump. By American intelligence officials, and the narratives and the people who promote it, like this guy Graf at Wired, <laughs> they never even acknowledge that as a remote possibility. Bob Mueller, Jim Comey, these are all saints; they're archangels, above any question or <laughs> suspicion. And here's a weird one today: Michael Cohen is admitting that in 2014 he、uh, engaged a company called Redfinch. Which was there to manipulate polls in favor of Trump. They tried to manipulate to get Trump into a list of the top 100 business leaders at CNBC. They also manipulated a poll at the Drudge Report. <laughs> That's not very hard to do. <laughs> And even despite、uh, their interference, Trump only placed fifth <laughs> in a poll about、uh, presidential candidates.、Uh, Now here's the other interesting item. Cohen appears to have the Trump virus of hiring people and then not paying them.、Uh, the guy from、uh, Red Finch, his name is Galger. He told the Wall Street Journal that Cohen never paid him the fifty grand he was promised for his services. Instead, at a meeting at Trump Tower, Cohen handed Galger a blue Walmart, a Walmart bag containing between twelve and thirteen thousand dollars in cash, as well as a boxing glove that Cohen claimed had been worn by a Brazilian mixed martial arts fighter. <laughs> What? <laughs> And the only denial from Cohen is that he never paid Gogger in cash. <laughs> Did he pay him?、Uh, we don't know that. So today, Trump went to the Pentagon, where、uh, he has an acting defense secretary, the guy named Shanahan, with 31 years、uh, of service to the Boeing Corporation. Anyway, he mouths some、uh, platitudes and sympathies about the four Americans who were killed in Syria yesterday. Now, we did learn from that that two of them were uniformed soldiers. One was a mercenary, a so-called contractor, and the fourth was a, 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 a civilian employee of the Defense Intelligence Agency. And just right there, that little group of who died. Suggests that there are probably more than 2,000 U.S. soldiers deployed in Syria. We don't know the total number, but Trump、uh, really deserves blame because of the way he has bungled his announced plan to pull U.S. troops out of Syria, and I believe that led the Islamic State to stage this suicide bomber attack and to、uh, try to、uh, say, "Hey, look, we're still here." And it didn't help that Mike Pence was giving a speech announcing that the Islamic State had been eliminated and defeated. At the very time that we learned that these four Americans were killed in the attack in Monbiche, and so this has led to this bizarre scene where alleged liberals like Rachel Maddow cover this in a way that gives a clear signal to viewers that the right position to take is to keep U.S. troops. In Syria. Now, the fact that、uh, we don't have any authorization, invitation, there's no war powers declaration from the United States. It is completely illegal. But because Trump wants to end it, even in a bungling way, the corporate media rallies the mainstream to oppose Trump on this maneuver. And I think if that hadn't occurred, we would have seen. A much more uh, uh, quick and safe retreat of American forces from Syria.
But last week Bolton was overseas, and he set new conditions for the withdrawal. And it suggests to me that next we're going to see another one of those false flag chemical weapon attacks in Syria that can be blamed on the Assad government. Now, while at the Pentagon, Trump borrowed another page from the Reagan era. You know, he stole "Make America Great Again" from Ronnie, and now he is embracing the boondoggle of Star Wars missile defense. There was a missile defense review. I didn't even know about this, and it、uh, lists North Korea and Iran, their ballistic missiles, then Russia and China as the threats that we face. And so Trump、uh, says we want、uh, deeper investments. Now we have already burned through three hundred billion dollars, and the success rate, even of the rigged tests for American Star Wars missile defense, is below fifty percent. The most recent test in May of 17、uh, were told successfully smashed the mock target to smithereens. But there's a whole lot of bullshit when it comes to missile defense. Ted Postel, the expert retired from MIT, has evaluated the vaunted Israeli Iron Dome system, which Israel claims is 90 percent effective.、And、Postel says the effective rate is in single digits, <laughs> but. You know these are effective deterrents as a PR mechanism, and who cares how much it costs, right? We're learning that there were more children separated from their parents far earlier than has been reported. In the summer of 2017, a year before the general public knew about mass family separations, officials at the Health and Human Services Department's Office of Refugee Resettlement observed a steep increase in the number of children that they were receiving. The proportion of separated children from parents increased in August of 2017 from a baseline average of about 0.3 percent to a number that is 3.6 percent. That represents thousands of children who may have been separated, and、uh, we still don't have the data on them. And the guy who's been tracking this is Lee Gallant, deputy director at the ACLU's Immigrants' Rights Project. He said this policy was a cruel disaster from the start. This report reaffirms that the government never had a clear picture of how many children it ripped from their parents. And good reporting at the Intercept today, under the byline of Ryan Devereaux. He notes that、uh, there's the first of three trials getting started in Arizona, prosecuting humanitarians, and these are people of faith, who went along the paths that are commonly used by. Illegal border crossers, and they left water and, in some cases, clothing or food supplies. And this has led to prosecution by various government departments that have jurisdiction over this、uh, open border、uh, territory. And we know that some three thousand people have died、uh, traversing that area since two thousand. That's in the last eighteen years. The most serious charges have been、uh, laid against Scott Warren, a thirty-six-year-old professor. Who the government is charged with three felony counts of harboring and conspiracy for providing food, water, and a place to sleep to two undocumented men for three days last January. He faces 20 years in prison, and his other uh, activists uh, have a trial unfolding in Tucson right now. It's really sad to see our government so cruelly and ruthlessly punish people who. Simply, are humanitarian. They want to allow people to continue living, and this is just another ugly facet of American policy these days. I believe this is an effort to justify shifting money to pay for the wall in the event Trump declares an emergency and tries to do it that way. The Trump administration says that providing additional disaster funding for Puerto Rico's food stamp program is excessive and unnecessary. Yeah, hey, let them eat plantains, right? Now, the request from Puerto Rico that was approved by Congress is six hundred million dollars, but the White House says the, there's no indication that households need ongoing support at this time, or that Puerto Rico requires additional time to return to normal operations. Now, you need to understand that、uh, Puerto Rico always. Operates on a second-class basis, and the governor there, a Republican who has kissed Trump's ass repeatedly, is still getting the cold shoulder. His name is Rosello. He has pleaded with Trump to meet with him, but get this: 
already in Puerto Rico. The rules for the SNAP program, as compared with the、uh, people who live on the mainland, well, the food stamp program in Puerto Rico has a lower poverty threshold, meaning that it's not available to thousands of people who are too poor. And this is just shocking. Puerto Rico's poverty rate, even before the hurricanes, was 44 percent compared to 12 percent nationally, and yet. We can rationalize punishing them further. Every day, I pause for a moment to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins Podcast with your subscriptions. And let's see who's on the list today: Suzanne Bowen, also Aiden McAleer, Auntie Lundberg, and the Incredible Faith Peoples. They all kick in five to twenty dollars a month to support my work, and I'd love to see you on this list very soon. Just visit peterbcollins.com. There's a menu tab. Then choose become a subscriber. You land on the sign up page. You can choose five, ten, twenty dollars a month, the fifty dollar annual subscription. And if you're allergic to PayPal, my mailing address is box one fifty six sixty, San Rafael, California, zip code nine four nine one five. A woman who was born in the United States as Melanie Franklin in the city of New Orleans. And who has adopted the name Marzia Hashemi, and works on the English language Iranian news channel called Press TV. Well, she was detained in St. Louis when she arrived at an airport a few days ago, and transferred by the FBI to a detention center in Washington D.C., where she was held for two days before managing to contact her family. Now, I haven't seen an update, but I believe she is still in custody. The charges have not been announced,、uh, and uh, uh, the only thing that I can guess at this stage is that Trump is trying to pick up his own hostage to trade the Iranians for an American who's been held there for about six months in Tehran, and who may or may not be a spy for the United States. It also may be just a way to try to provoke tensions with Iran, and that's what John Bolton and、uh, Donny Trump want. There's another case that got my attention yesterday, and I want to thank listener Fred. And by the way, Fred is the guy who asked for a scholarship subscription recently, and we set that up yesterday. And we want to credit Dell Leonard, who lives in Maine, who generously funded Fred's scholarship. Anyway,、uh, because I think Fred knows I don't follow sports, and I'd never heard of the New York Knicks center Enes Kanter. Now, Cantor is a Turkish citizen. He's applied to become an American citizen, but he's on a wait list right now. And the team flew to London yesterday for a an exhibition game, and Cantor declined to go. And he made the right call because Turkey put out an extradition request and an Interpol red notice. He would have been arrested on his arrival at Heathrow in London. Now, why? Well. Erdogan and the Turkish government treat Cantor as a suspect because of his connections to Fethullah Gulen. Gulen is accused by Erdogan of the leader of the attempted coup in 2016, and it was fascinating to see on the public television news hour last night. Cantor appeared, and he said that on the night of the coup, I believe it was July 15th of 2016, he was with Fethullah Gulen at his compound in Pennsylvania. And he said, when they were informed of the attempted coup in Turkey, they were all shocked. Now, I cannot speak to the basketball star's relationship to Mr. Gulen. I have my own suspicions about Gulen. I don't support his extradition to Turkey, and I believe that Trump will trade him for something in the future. But I think it's a fascinating story, and Cantor seems like a very credible individual. Yesterday, I told you the heartbreaking news from Dar Jamal's new book, *The End of Ice*, that we've already cooked the planet. Species are dying off on a daily basis, and here's confirmation of that. Front page on my San Francisco Chronicle today: the grand and、uh, much admired monarch butterfly population is declining sharply and rapidly. Now, looking at the big picture since the 1980s, the count of butterflies has declined by 99.4 percent. But the more stunning figure is that the population count that was conducted last fall 
showed an 86 percent drop in the monarch butterfly population in California in one year alone. That's stunning. What will it take to wake up the world to the calamity that we are visiting on ourselves? Interesting that a congresswoman, Democrat from Silicon Valley, Anna Eshoo, who I've met with a few times, she has introduced legislation related to the rollout of 5G wireless. She is address, addressing just one aspect of the multiple concerns that have been raised about the siting of these new antennas and the equipment connected to it, about the health and safety risks to the population with uh, these uh, transmitters located uh, at 500-foot intervals and people bathing in the waves essentially uh, 24-7. Well, Eshu doesn't address any of those issues, but to her credit, she does address one of the underlying problems, and that is that the Federal Communications Commission issued regulations that preempt local governments and their efforts to regulate the deployment of 5G wireless infrastructure. And so she is saying that as a former county official, she wants to give county governments and local governments the authority they need about whether to rent space on utility poles for 5G and how to manage the other issues that arise from it. So we'll see if that gains any traction. Well, the FBI has rescued us from another dastardly plot by a would-be domestic terrorist. And this one has the, <laughs> the blueprint in great detail. I'm looking at a story from the Associated Press, Dateline Atlanta. A Georgia man accused of plotting to use an anti-tank rocket, rocket to storm into the White House was arrested in a sting Wednesday after he traded his car for guns and explosives. Now, that first paragraph set off the alarm for me because we've seen this before. There was a case in Illinois of a mentally retarded teenager who was set up for a terrorist plot by his paid FBI informant. And when he said, look, I don't have any money, the guy said, well, I know somebody who will trade your stereo speakers for some C4, C5, whatever the explosives are. Well, in the case of 21-year-old Hasher Jalal Tahe, uh, Taheb of Cumming, Georgia, well, you can get a pretty clear idea that this guy is several bricks shy of a load. And in the fourth paragraph of the AP story, a local law enforcement agency contacted the FBI in March after getting a tip. The affidavit says that Taheb told a confidential FBI source in October he planned to travel abroad for Hijra, which is described as traveling to territory controlled by the Islamic State, but gosh, he didn't have a passport. So instead, he said he wanted to carry out an attack in the United States. During one meeting with an agent, Taheb advised that if they were to go to another country, they'd be one of many, but if they stayed in the United States, they could do more damage. He wanted to be a martyr. He showed the undercover agent a hand-drawn diagram of the ground floor of the west wing of the White House and a detailed plan for the attack. He told the undercover agent he had never shot a gun, but he could learn easily, and he'd watch some videos. And, of course, with cameras rolling... They busted him yesterday. And I looked at the same story from BuzzFeed. They barely mention that he had an undercover FBI team attached to him. And they exclude most of the details that I just shared with you. Quite telling. In Chicago, where I went to university and got my big break, started in a radio in Chicago in the 1970s, I learned a lot about the corrupt police department there. Things haven't changed much. This week, we're going to see the sentencing of uh, Jason Van Dyke, the officer convicted for second-degree murder of Laquan McDonald, and, most importantly, the cops who helped him cover that up, three of them, face sentencing tomorrow in Chicago. And breaking up the wall of blue is, I think, one of the mo most important gains we could make in reforming our corrupt police system. Also in Chicago, the 10th out of a reported 50 individuals who were framed for murder by a single Chicago cop, whose name was Ronaldo Guevara, 
Well, the latest man exonerated who spent 17 years in prison is Geraldo Iglesias. I knew I was innocent, he said. I was just trying to get somebody to listen to me, and he even at his sentencing in 1995. He said, I'd like to say I apologize. I'm sorry for what happened to the young lady. I send my condolences to the family, but I had nothing to do with it. And the Lord knows I had nothing to do with it. And it took this long to clear that up. And finally today, I have a lot of respect for Brian Sonnenstein, who writes about prisons for shadow proof. And in his latest report, he looks at a report from the subcommittee of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee on the Bureau of Prisons, the federal prison operator here in the United States. And they confirm that there is still a culture of fear and retaliation in federal prisons and that wardens often investigate themselves or their underlings and exonerate them without any further scrutiny. Misconduct was largely tolerated or ignored altogether, said the report. It highlighted two cases in which sexual harassment by senior officials led to retaliation. Subordinates were verbally berated, transferred to other facilities, and demoted. And the most troubling part of this is the uh, First Step Act that Trump signed on the day that he sent the government into shutdown with Van Jones and others standing by taking credit for it. Well, one of the flaws in the First Step Act, it has good intentions. The effort is to try to get inmates at a prison within 500 miles of their families. But guess who gets to decide if that accommodation will be granted? It will be the warden of the prison where that prisoner is currently incarcerated. And that allows for all kinds of paybacks and punishments and other irregular motives for denying a prisoner Assignment to a facility close to his family. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. You're free to share it far and wide. And I'm still Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails